Today on the Crispy Cast, we open up with Arcade Network where we discuss the massive Chinese company Tencent beginning to make moves in the Western gaming market. And then we discuss Ubisoft, who are right now in a lot of hot water, not for something specifically gaming related, but because many, many allegations of sexual harassment and sexual assault have started to be levied against the company. Then, we move on to something awful, where we discuss some influencers possibly being of really bad influences, with multiple creators under fire for large parties down during a massive global pandemic. Then, we end off this episode with the return of our review series, Crispy Verses, against Netflix originals. We start with a movie called The Old Guard. Timestamps, as always, are in the description down below. Sit back and relax. You are listening to The Crispy Cast. Before we begin this episode of the Crispy Cast, I do have a couple of announcements. Number one, in case you couldn't tell by the date of this podcast, there will not be a uh, I Saw This on the Internet episode this weekend because the Crispy Cast is taking its slot. There will be a Crispy Cast this Wednesday, and then I am planning an episode of I Saw This on the Internet, but its release date is not confirmed, so we're going to figure that out as we go. I really love the reception on that new series. I hope you think you guys have been enjoying it based on the amount of likes. So that's awesome. Thank you so much for watching, and I will continue to make them if you guys enjoy them. Also, we have a new-ish series coming to the YouTube channel. No, it's not gaming related. I will figure out what I want to do with video games uh, at some point. But uh, yeah, we are going to be uploading, or I'm going to be uploading, uh, segments of Crispy Verses as their own videos on YouTube. So uh, I'm just going to be taking them out of the podcast and putting them in a little video and then uploading that as like its own little thing. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how much I want to edit it, how much I want to spruce up the audio because this is still a mostly improv podcast with notes, but I want those reviews to be at least a little bit more formal than my normal just free form podcasting. So I'm going to see how that goes, how I'm going to edit it, how long it's going to take, but I hope to do it at least uh, once every couple weeks. Uh, But we all know I probably won't stick to that schedule. Finally, or maybe, no, this is the second one. I do have a little improv announcement that I realized like just before recording this, but uh, my third announcement is that the podcast, the audio version of this podcast on Spotify, iTunes, all that, has finally been updated. All of the episodes can be listened to on Spotify, iTunes, the other ones, Anchor, all that good stuff. You can listen without having to waste data or battery life on YouTube. That's that's great. Isn't that great? Um, I will continue to upload this podcast to those platforms instead of leaving them behind like I did previously. Sorry about that, by the way. I got really lazy, and I forgot kind of how easy it is to do that. It was a lot less painful than I thought it would be uploading all that stuff. So, yeah. My final announcement, this is the improv one, is before recording this, I realized that um, aside from all like the normal... Uh, kind of incidental noises that sort of happened throughout this podcast. Uh, There has been a really annoying buzzing if you're a headphones user. If you're like just listening on like the computer, it's hard to notice, but if you're using headphones or um, earbuds, that's where it becomes very noticeable. Sorry about that. I am 90% sure I know exactly what it is. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's just my air conditioning because Uh, In case you guys haven't noticed, it's summer, and it's really fucking hot down here. I'm talking over 100 degrees sometimes, and um, while my office doesn't get that hot, it's still pretty rough when I don't have, like, a fan or high air conditioning. 
Um, I've turned off the fan, not the air conditioning. There's, I'm not, come on, I'm not trying to kill myself. So, uh, the air conditioning is still on. I'm going to try cleaning the audio and being more responsible about that. So, if you're listening to this podcast with headphones and the recent episodes have been a little bit annoying because of the stupid buzzing, I am so sorry about that. I'm going to try fixing that uh, right away. Okay. I think that's all. I think that's all of our announcements for this episode. And we've been talking about announcements long enough that I think I can justify one of my dramatic transitions. So, guys, it is time to move on to Arcade Network. Okay, so, our first story in this little video game segment is Tencent. Now, if you don't know who Tencent is, they are a massive, massive, massive Chinese company with bucket loads of cash. They buy out stock in a lot of uh, big gaming companies down here that you may know about, such as Activision Blizzard, Riot Games, a bunch of other people I can't think of right now. But yeah, they own a lot of stock in a lot of different companies. If you can name a gaming company, they probably have stock in that gaming company, which has been a very successful venture for them, evidently given their boatload of cash. Um, However, they haven't made many games down here in the West. A lot of the game market is interesting because a lot of Japanese games are can be very successful down here in the West and vice versa. However, the Chinese market doesn't really leave China, right? Uh, I couldn't name a Chinese game I've played down here just off the top of my head, like I have to look it up. I'm sure I might have played one at one point, but I can't think of one because it doesn't happen very often. Um, But Tencent is aiming to change that. They are going to be, they have, okay, so in case you didn't see it, uh, there was a trailer that went around YouTube, got a few hundred thousand views, it was published, I think, I believe last week at the time of recording this. Uh, It's a new cyberpunk game that they're making called Cyberpunk Code S-Y-N. So, I'll link the trailer down in the description down below. The picture, if you're watching the video version, the picture for this segment should be the trailer um, or a a screen cap from the trailer. And yeah, uh, if you're not going to watch the trailer and if you're on the audio version, I'll just describe it to you real quick. It was not that impressive. Now, I'm I'm a person who definitely believes um, graphic... Wrong way around. Gameplay over graphics. I believe if your gameplay is solid then you can sort of, like, let the graphics go. I'd prefer your game look good, right? I don't need every game to look photorealistic, but I prefer that they succeed in some sort of art style, right? I prefer the game to look good. But if your game is if plays well enough, I can sort of, like, look past that, right? However, this isn't a game. This is a trailer, and trailers should look good. And this doesn't. It looks incredibly unimpressive. I'm assuming, at least I'm hoping, it's a gameplay trailer. If this is pre-rendered, then I don't know what they were doing because this looks like a very crappy iPhone 5 mobile game. There was even what even looked like power-ups, like very crappily placed power-ups. Like in one of those, um, in one of those, like, build-your-own-level uh, sections in a game where you just kind of, like, sporadically place, like, oversized items in, in the world space to to use. It looks like one of those. It looks like someone built this inside of a better game, right? In, like, one of those build-your-own-level engines. Like, someone made this in Disney Infinity. Except Disney Infinity looks ten times better graphically than this. The, um, the game's... Style? It can't really be called a style. There's not much here. The lighting is god awful, and the the buildings are very generic. But you can kind of see where they're coming from with the whole look. Uh, it's it looks like they took <clears throat> heavy inspiration, let's say, from Cyberpunk 2077, which is a game that recently was delayed. If you didn't know about that, well, sorry, it was delayed. Uh, which is a 
it's a good thing for hype because hype for that game is boiling over the surface and people really want to play uh, Cyberpunk 2077. It's a very highly anticipated game. So to see this uh, huge Chinese like conglomerate making a crappy looking ripoff of Cyberpunk 2077 when people are anticipating that game so highly yeah, it set people off the wrong way. If you do go down to the trailer linked in the description, you will see that the like to dislike ratio is very negative. It's not in the favor of Tencent, which for them is unfortunate. Additionally, uh, Tencent, not, they're not just investing in this game, they're also investing in a new studio in LA. Now, I want to put in perspective, this is a very considerable investment. Studios, game studios in LA are just like most big tech companies. They have a shit ton of competition. On top of that, living in LA is not cheap at all. The housing prices are uh, something. They're, they are very expensive. That's just, that's just how it is in LA. And unfortunately, you have to pay your employees... I mean, ideally, you pay your employees enough that they stay with you. So you need to pay them enough to survive and live comfortably in L.A., which is a very sizable salary. On top of that, you have to invest in the studio space itself. Say it's very difficult to start a new studio in L.A., but Tencent are doing it. Lightspeed Studios is what it's called. It is a very significant investment on their part, like I've already said. It's intense, and it's very confusing to me why they're doing this. In case you guys haven't noticed, while the world may have been halted, or at least America, may have been halted by COVID, uh, the gaming industry has been pushing pretty hard recently. Just recently, we've had a pretty significant amount of great game releases, like um, I really want to review Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, Eventually, I'm still... The, the worst part about making this podcast was that I had to drag myself away from playing Ghost of Tsushima. That game is amazing. Uh, no matter what you think of The Last of Us Part Two's story, the game itself has been uber successful and has sold, like, millions and millions upon millions of copies. Um, we are getting a new generation of consoles. Uh, I believe this winter, but, you know, it might get delayed. But we are getting a new generation of consoles. Uh, we are getting uh, tons of new games that come with those consoles. There's a new Halo coming out. Uh, we got a new Assassin's Creed game. Uh, there is so much coming late 2020 and 2020 throughout 2021. I mean, we're starting a new generation, which means a new generation of games too. Meaning, right now, this new studio is going to have intense competition, and I'm not just talking about from third, um, from third party, from triple A, triple A, not third party. They both have three involved in them. I get them mixed up sometimes. I don't know why. I, I'm dumb. Triple A. It's not just triple A developers that you need to worry about. Indie developers are also getting in on the action. In case you didn't see the PlayStation reveal, there are tons of new indie games that are coming out. Some of which may not catch traction. Some of which may become the next Minecraft or Five Nights at Freddy's or uh, Hello Neighbor, right? Those small games that end up blowing up and becoming super successful with a new generation of tech. This is a very hectic time for gaming. There's a lot of stuff going on in the industry right now, and I'm really confused why Tencent chooses this time to get on the, on the action. You'd think, especially since it's a new studio, you'd think they'd wait until things chill out a little bit, but no. I don't know what their end game is here. I'm not a business person and don't claim to be. I'm no industry expert. I have, frankly, I'm just a dude who plays video games. I don't know everything about the ins and outs of the industry. So maybe this is a really super smart business move. Maybe they do have a massive, very intelligent plan in play that I just can't see. But it is, at least to me, as a, you know, amateur, <laughs> very confusing. I do recommend that you cosh be cautious about Lightspeed Studios, uh, especially given their ownership of by Tencent. Uh, so, I know a lot of people who have seen that name are already going to avoid Lightspeed Studios like the plague. 
But yeah, uh, I do, I do truly advise you to be cautious. A new studio is owned by huge um, foreign companies. Well, they, there's a history there, and sometimes it goes very badly. So, in terms of game development and all that, so be cautious is what I'm saying. Anyway, I think I've talked enough about that. It's time to talk about something even more awful than that, involving a company called Ubisoft that you, you know, might have heard of. Okay, so Ubisoft, they're in very hot water. Now, Ubisoft had their Uplay event, and that Uplay event came amid... Uh, or around the same time as many, many, many controversies that broke out against the company. Now I'm gonna pull up a little bit of stuff here. Give me a second. But yeah, Ubisoft has been a lot, I've been under fire for sexual assault, sexual harassment allegations, both of which are, to say the least, grossly understated very 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 bad um not only that but we've also seen uh company statements from ubisoft ubisoft in general like through these statements has seemed to be a very toxic company to work at if you're a woman and also uh they have some very questionable business decisions especially when it comes to their game i distinctly remember an article from jason schreier he published information that shows that Ubisoft decided to remove, uh, they decided to sort of like, uh, not come, she's still there, but they, they kind of like pushed aside the female protagonist for, um, the Assassin's Creed Odyssey because apparently according to Ubisoft, women don't sell. I also noticed, that's not the first time they've done it either. Uh, I also noticed that happened with Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Which was a game I actually kind of enjoyed. And I, I, in that game, in case you didn't see, there is a, there are two assassins, uh, brother and sister. In the cinematic trailer for the game, the brother is the only one in it. You wouldn't have even known the sister exists. She's not in the trailer at all. And in a lot of the marketing material, the sister looks like just another one of the side characters. The brother is front and center, even though in the actual game, they share the spotlight very often. In fact, some people, depending on which playstyle you prefer, will actually play the sister more. So, why was she pushed out of the frame? I always thought, I always thought it was weird. I, I, I figured, oh, they just wanted a central protagonist or something, uh, but... I mean, based on this report from Schreier, it's po very possible, in fact, very probable, that they did a similar thing to Evie Fry, the sister in Assassin's Creed Syndicate, that they did to the uh, female protagonist of Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Basically pushing her out of the spotlight because apparently, according to them, if you have a woman as the protagonist of your game, won't sell as well. Even though, I don't have the data to prove it, but, I mean, have you seen The Last of Us? Have you seen Horizon Zero Dawn? I, Ubisoft, have you been paying attention recently? I mean, uh, like, guys, no matter what you think about The Last of Us Part Two's story, like I said, the game has sold incredibly well. And Horizon Zero Dawn had no controversy at all. It just sold very well and was received very positively by all. So, or I shouldn't say by all, by the vast majority. How about that? So... I don't know what Ubisoft is thinking that women don't sell <laughs> games. That's that to me is very confusing because it's you know it's it's not true. But on top of that, that's like a little that's business hokey pokey whatever. That's bad. But this is even worse. I mean, essentially, Ubisoft has promoted a horrible culture in their own company where a lot of women have been sexually harassed, sexually assaulted. And a lot of them haven't been able to get anything done about it, which is awful. And this has been a thing that's ongoing. Like, a, a misconception with these sort of things that happen is, oh, well, 
these all this stuff happened so so long ago it happened like two years ago or three years ago in extreme cases 10 years ago people are like oh well why didn't they report it back then well at least in this case they did and in many cases they do it's just that they need to do it with multiple people in order to get the attention it needs to actually get stuff done that's not the way it should be it's bad that that has to be done and you need like a crowd in order to get attention to these horrible actions and things that are happening but unfortunately that's the way it is that's why all these allegations are coming out at a similar time it's it's like why the me too movement blew up so big is because so many so many people have been affected in that particular situation they needed to band together, right? In order to get something done. And luckily they, they did. And here it's it's not as huge, but it's it's like a continuation of that in different industries. It's similar to the Smash Bros controversy, all that stuff, both a lot of men and women coming out because when they come out independently, uh, they often don't get listened to. So that's why, that's why often you'll see all these people banding together in order to get this done. It's not some kind of like mass cancellation process. I have seen that happen. That has happened before. Not saying that never happens, but in this case, it's, it's not a mass cancellation process. It's people banding together to get stuff done that they couldn't do on their own. In this case, getting this toxic bullshit out of a gaming company. So, yeah, I don't really... There, Ubisoft has actually responded. A spokesperson actually came out and said that this stuff is unacceptable and they're taking action, which I was shocked by. And many of the victims were shocked by, too, because Ubisoft, for many years, had been hiding this behavior, which is, you know, atrocious and terrible, to say the least. All of this is a really big, big, big hit for Ubisoft, especially since they had their massive Uplay press conference recently, so... This is a really, really big hit for them. And, I mean, I uh, believe it was Paul Tassi on Forbes saying it best. Ubisoft really, really needs to pick up their shit and get a win right now. They are in hot water. Very hot water. Now, this is a travesty. And it's been it's it's been happening a lot in the gaming industry. I mean, the, I talked about this same thing. Uh, last week, I think two weeks, well, at this point, two weeks ago with Smash Bros. And before that, I talked about it with In Destiny. And there were tons of games that I didn't cover. I mean, this shit, this shit happens way more than I think a lot of people realize. Like, this is a, a constant problem, and it really shouldn't be. It, it is truly sad and unacceptable. I'm happy that something's being done about it. But I'm sad that anything needs to be done in the first place. This shit shouldn't happen, frankly. It, it, it really it really disheartens me that it's happening in an industry and in a, in a, in a hobby that I enjoy so much. It, it really sucks. Ubisoft has is no stranger to controversies, but it's usually stuff that's, you know, like business jargon. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's stuff like... Uh, their practice of yearly annual shitty releases. It's their practice of rushing games. It's their practice of false advertising during uh, press conferences. It's the practice of uh, m crappy uh, mag microtransactions. Stuff like that. Um, this is this is a whole nother level. It is truly unacceptable. So yeah, Ubisoft is in hot water, and the company definitely has it coming, to say the least. But yeah, I think I think that's enough of that. Um, it it is uh, I can't understate it enough. It is truly a tragedy that this happened at all. It it really does suck. But yeah, I think we need to. Well, I don't know if it truly applies here since this is an awful thing. But I have to do the the tra traditional transition. It's time to move on to something else. It's time to move on to something that's also awful. Alright. So, I know this will come as a shock to so many people, but some influencers are not a great influence. So, I said in the intro, but I'll say it again, multiple creators are under fire 
for being at these very large, uh, big parties during a during this pandemic. Of course, um, it's in it's in the in the western regions of the United States, which has definitely not been hit lightly uh, by COVID. It is it's yeah it's 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 definitely a problem. So I don't want to see, I've already seen a couple tweets like, Oh, they must be in a region that wasn't hit that bad. Stop whining. Well, they, they are in a region that was hit very bad. And in general, it's still just not a good idea. See, here's the thing. Before we even get to any of the nitty gritty, I want to establish this much. These aren't just your everyday people. They are influencers through any combination of good looks, hard work, mostly luck, they have somehow gotten a platform. And unfortunately, that means that you need to hold yourself accountable to some things. It doesn't mean that you need to be like a godly human being or anything like that, but you should like try to be a positive influence. You know, I remember, you guys know who Dan TDM is. He's a great, if honestly, if, they're, if I'm babysitting a kid, or a kid asks me, like, what should I watch on YouTube? I'm recommending Dan Tedium. He's just, he's a great channel for kids. He seems like a really nice guy. He's got a decent sense of humor. He's cool. He's not annoying. Like, he's not like, um, he's not like most Fortnite YouTubers who, like, get on your nerves real quick. And he gets really salty about what they're doing. He seems like just an everyday, he just seems like a nice guy. And he did an interview for BBC, I believe. Yeah, it was BBC that I will always remember. He was very different on that interview. He was very mature. And he said in that interview that his greatest fear is influencing people the wrong way. Because he has a platform. And he mostly, his audience is mostly children. So he is scared to death about influencing them a bad way. Which is why he's so careful about what he says and what he does. And you know what? That made me respect him. 10 times more than I already did. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people need to learn from him because when you are going to these massive parties and you're screwing around and you're posting about it on social media, your fans see that. And they, for better or for fucking worse, are influenced, influencer, by the things you do. Which is why <clears throat> James Charles, Tana Mo Mojo, Emma Chamberlain, other people, Laure, Laure, the guy from TikTok who started this whole shebang, he had a birthday and he had a party at his, at his place. At, or I don't know if it was his place. I'll need to look that up. I'll put like a thing in the comments. I, I, I usually put corrections when I got stuff wrong. I don't know if it was his place or if it was someone else's place. Big ass mansion. I don't. It, it was a big mansion. They were all gathered in it. It doesn't really matter. But yeah, uh, Lare, I believe, is the way you pronounce his name. It was his birthday, and that's why they were all partying. There were tons of YouTubers and TikTokers at this party, uh, fucking around, not social distancing, <laughs> to, you know, uh, in case you couldn't figure that out. Definitely no mask wearing, you know, you, you need to look good for the photos, right? You gotta have your the lower part of your face in those photos or else, I mean, did the party actually happen? Come on. But yeah, jokes aside, this is, this is bad. <laughs> um, obviously none of those, none of these influencers are going to see this podcast, but if you guys are on social media or if you guys are doing anything just make sure to be responsible if you don't need to go out and do that thing then you don't really need to do it if someone if you if you really want to have a crazy party then don't that's it <laughs> that's the message of this whole thing we're in the middle of a pandemic just stay inside you'll live i promise you'll survive I'm sure you have supplies that could last you a good few months if you really, really spread them out. You'll be fine. You'll you'll live. I'm just kidding. If you, I'm, I'm joking. I was joking about the supplies thing. Go if you need food, go to the groceries. Okay, go to the go to the groceries. Don't starve yourself to death for the sake of social distancing. But if you if you don't need to go out, then don't go out. That's that's just a simple thing. You gotta go to work. Go to work. 
Do you have to go to a party? Not really. These are content creators who really didn't have to be here. And a lot of them, you know, really ticked me the wrong way was one, a lot of them were promoting social distancing and staying indoors. Meanwhile, they're fucking around doing this shit. And then two, a lot of them were bragging about it and, and posting about it on social media. Now I wanna do, I, I do wanna be fair. I do want to be fair to uh, Laure, Laure, Laure. Uh, he did respond to this uh, controversy. He said, I understand 100% where you're coming from, and it was a dumb thing to do. He was responding to another big influencer who kind of called him out and called out a bunch of people uh, for, these, for these party shenanigans. Now, as of recording this, no one other than him has, respo has responded. So, yeah, there's that. Um, also, Jake Paul had a massive party. Oh, yeah. Um, he didn't go to jail, by the way. I don't know why people thought he, he would go to jail. Uh, I, th I think Keemstar was doing that thing where he sort of um, uh, half true does the half-truth fake news kind of bullshit and the clickbait where he's like, Jake Paul going to jail. Yeah, he wasn't going. He, he's not going to jail. Which is funny because Keemstar also was lighting people up for saying Onision is going to go to jail. Huh. Anyway, maybe he's a hypocrite. Hmm. Anyway, point is, Jake Paul is not in jail. Do you know what he is doing? He's having a massive party at his at his place. Uh, obviously not social distancing, and he doesn't seem to care because um, someone tweeted him uh, a "fuck you," which he retweeted. So yeah, he doesn't. He definitely doesn't give a shit. Uh, even if Jake Paul did issue an apology, I he like it doesn't really mean anything. He's definitely not gonna change his ways. He's Jake Paul, right? He's the internet's biggest dumbass. So, yeah, he's just gotta. He, I suppose he has to play the part. But yeah, that is that's my little update on influencers, guys. Take a t the big takeaway is try stay indoors as much as you can. We are still in the middle of a crisis, and the coronavirus doesn't really care if you're over it, right? So. All right, I don't really know any other way to transition to our next topic, but it's time for Crispy versus Netflix's The Old Guard. One on one, go! The Old Guard is directed by Gina Prince Bythewood and stars Charlize Theron and Kiki Lane, and is about a group of mercenaries, all centuries old immortals, with the ability to heal themselves, discover someone who is on to their secret, and they must fight to protect their freedom. Now, let's start out with the presentation of this show. The direction is very strong. There's a lot of really cool fight choreography and fight scenes in here. Uh, most of the fights take place in somewhat interesting locations. I did find that this is very action movie like. Uh, you have a lot of somewhat familiar set pieces that you feel like you've seen in other movies. At this point, we have all probably seen at least a dozen or two dozen action movies, so stuff does seem to kind of find its way into all trappings of the action movie genre but here they try to keep it unique enough especially since these people are all immortal mercenaries so the directors and the fight choreographer uh they do have some fun with it right on top of that uh the the look of the show itself i didn't like the music now i usually don't talk about music on this podcast but if your music is great and amazing i'll talk about it if your music rubs me the wrong way i'll also talk about it if your music is just okay i don't really care it, it's like i'll live but yeah the music here was very disappointing like i said earlier the fights in this movie are very well done like the fight choreography the fights are very engaging a lot it, it's great all good stuff However, the music these fights are tuned to is not so good. The f they it doesn't I don't really know how to describe it. It doesn't hit as hard 
as the fights themselves. The music is too soft, is how I'd say it. All of it is lyrical music, which, you know, poppy sort of alternative songs, I suppose I'd describe it. I'm no expert. Which I don't have a problem with. I would prefer just a instrumental OST because that's easier to sort of keep your mind on what's happening on screen while not kind of distracting you. But the music often does distract me and it's a bad and it's a bad way. It is in a bad way. The music often takes away from the fights and not because it's good, it's just because it does it doesn't feel like it fits. Like I said, it, it's too soft what's happening on screen and I don't like it. It doesn't hit as hard as the fights. And it's not it's uh it's not good. <laughs> Which is really annoying because the fights themselves are great. Uh, the story? The story is actually pretty good. I love the premise. The premise is really, really fun. It is based off a graphic novel, so the premise isn't entirely the movies. But it is a really cool idea. Uh, it's a very character-driven story, which is what brings me to the characters. I'll start out with the bad. The villain in this movie is just very, very generic. Bad guy, CEO dude. I, I did not care for him. I saw the same character in a, do in a dozen other flicks and TV shows. I really did not care for the bad guy here. Uh, I did like a lot of the protagonists. Charlize Theron can carry anything. If someone gave her literally like two lines describing a character she could probably make it into like this kick-ass awesome person charlie theron can carry anything and she is the backbone of this movie she's great kiki lane is kind of a newcomer i have n not seen her before in an another picture but she was also very good in this movie at the beginning i kind of didn't know where they were going with her character i i thought they were kind of making her the uh naive rookie which uh, is it my fair favorite character trope? But as the movie progresses, she gets much, much better. A lot of what makes this movie is the backstory behind the four main immortal mercenaries, the ones that aren't the rookie. And they are really cool. I do like the backstories behind them. I do like how a lot of them feel uh, about their powers and about their situation. They all... They all feel like they're handling it in like their own way, which is cool. I like that. Uh, it makes sense for their characters. It, it's neat. I'm all I'm all for characterization in movies, especially with such an interesting premise as this. However, I feel like it's it sort of feels like if you've played Destiny, it feels like they it feels like that, where they build up all this backstory, and then they don't do anything with it further. Like, there's these really small, tiny character moments, and that's it. Like, they don't really do anything with all these cool personalities they've built up, and that really sucks. Overall, the story is super character-focused, and when the story is delving into the characters' backgrounds and what they've done throughout their super long lives, the story's at its best. When it's trying to integrate those backgrounds into what's happening right now, the story sort of falters. Because it does it in a, such a weak way, which is so disappointing, because they've built up these interesting people, they've built up this interesting story, and they're not doing anything interesting with it. By the end of the movie, I was just like, huh? Wait, that's it? They're done? Okay. I feel like it would have worked better as a TV show, like this is the opening of a TV show. But no, instead they're trying to make another movie, which... I think is fine, but I do hope that they do more with the present plotline uh, rather than just fleshing out all this interesting history for each character and not doing anything with it. Overall, I'm going to give this movie a 6 out of 10. When you're a really character focused movie that doesn't do much with your characters, it's really rough. Charlie Theron is awesome, like I just said. She is amazing. She could carry any movie as far as I'm concerned. The action is fun, but it falters because of the music, which I have rarely seen. It's overall a fun experience. I, can, I went into this movie uh, expecting really nothing and came out with a smile on my face. There were a lot of really cool moments in the movie, but 
I'm more disappointed than I am anything else. Okay, it's time to wrap this up. Alright, if you guys enjoyed this episode of the Crispy Cast, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more content from me, then please do hit subscribe on the YouTube tr- side or follow on whatever platform you're listening on. And finally, if you're on the YouTube side, comment down below. In essence, like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you all next time. Farewell.